Hi everyone, my name is Victoria Zidanowitz and I'm a student in the College of Arts and Sciences studying biological anthropology. And today I'll be sharing my honors research titled uh, Assessing Orangutan Habitat Quality with, and the Conservation Value of a Secondary Forest Within Gunung Palang National Park. The Indonesian and Malaysian island of Borneo is home to the orangutan subspecies Pongo pygmaeus wormbi. These large-bodied arboreal primates have massive home ranges and spend nearly their entire lives navigating the forest on their own. Orangutan semi-solitary nature and ranging behaviors are reflective of the unpredictable environment that they inhabit. These dipter carp forests are characterized by dramatic changes in fruit availability over space and over time. And when preferred fruits, like those in the top right image, when they're scarce, orangutans rely on a very high fiber diet of leaves, bark, and pith, imaged on the bottom right. Such local ecology also shapes their life history. Life history refers to the events in an individual's lifetime pertaining to growth and development, reproduction, and survival. With a prolonged juvenile dependency period in about eight to 10 years between births, orangutans have the longest life history of any primate. And this makes them particularly vulnerable to disruptions in their environment and their energetic status. So while their risk of natural predation is fairly low, the, the long-term survival of this species is threatened by increasing human encroachment and the conversion of their primary forest habitat. The rainforests of Southeast Asia face, losses, face rates of degradation and deforestation exceeding rest of the world's tropical forests. Particular practices like selective logging target massive old growth trees which are essential to forest structure and function. For Bernay and orangutans, habitat loss coupled with increased human contact threaten what remains of their wild populations. Since 1950, their populations have declined by over 60% and are projected to further decline in the coming years. Right now, about 75% of all wild orangutans live outside protected areas, and li yet little is known about how orangutans are utilizing directed, degraded habitats. With rates of forest loss and fragmentation projected to rise, there is a need to explore the potential value of these human-modified landscapes in the conservation and long-term survival of this critically endangered species. My research aims to address this gap by investigating differences in orangutan habitat quality across Gunung Palang National Park. I approach this with two research questions. The first, how does orangutan habitat quality differ between an intact primary forest and a degraded <coughs> secondary forest? Secondly, what can the composition and structure of a degraded forest tell us about its conservation value? To orient you, Gunung Palang National Park is located here in West Kalimantan on the Indonesian island of Borneo. The GPNP landscape is one of the most important blocks of orangutan habitat and one of the only remaining lowland rainforests left in the island. The Gunung Palang Orangutan Conservation Project, or GPOCP, has collected data in this region on wild orangutans and their environment for nearly three decades. The Chabang Ponte Research Area, located here on the map, extends across seven distinct habitat types within an intact primary forest, where researchers are out following orangutans daily. In the late 1990s, government and economic crisis weakened uh, national park management, which resulted in significant selective logging along the Rangkong River here in the south. Since then, GPOCP has expanded their operations and constructed a secondary research site in order to begin surveying the logged secondary forest. Therefore, for my project, I had the opportunity to employ the robust data from Chabang Ponte, as well as the first year, the first full year of systematically collected data from the Rangkong. A critical first step in contextualizing habitat quality involves assessing forest structure and composition. And in this context, we're referring to the diversity, abundance, and size of key orangutan feeding trees. To address this, we use vegetation data collected from plots matched by habitat type across both sites. And within the plots, trees, figs, and lianas were tagged, identified, and measured for their DBH. And DBH refers to, it's a common measure used to calculate stem density, which is how much area a tree is taking up. And this image here is important. It is showing you the twisty lianas and strangler figs of these forests. So figs here are hemiepiphytes, which means that they grow on large host trees before sending roots down to the ground. And in almost an opposite manner, lianas start on the ground as small shrubs in their vines, and they grow up with the support of the trees surrounding them. So our first site of interest, the primary forest located at Chabang Ponte, for 16 out of 70 previously established plots we selected 16 for, um, for our comparative analysis. In the Rangkong degraded forest, the second site of interest, 16 vegetation plots across four transects were established in December of 2020 for monthly monitoring. So to look at differences in habitat quality and um, conservation, 
We assessed the general forest structure and species composition at both sites, as well as the orangutan feeding tree abundance and density. In first investigating diversity, we looked at two different diversity indices. So this one is showing uh, the, the Shannon diversity index, which is a classic measure of diversity that assumes all species were represented in the sample and sampled randomly. And so with this metric, we can see that there was no significant difference in the stem diversity between sites. We also investigated this using the Simpson diversity index, which is a measure that gives more weight to common or dominant species. And this furthered our finding with the previous index that there doesn't appear to be a significant difference in overall stem diversity looking at these matched habitats between the primary forest, the lime green, and the degraded, the dark. Next, we looked at forest structure by analyzing the abundance of small and large feeding trees at both sites. And from this plot, you can see that there's a dramatic difference with there being many more small trees, so the dark green bars, um, in the degraded forest compared to the primary forest. If you look at the abundance of trees with a DBH, oh my goodness, okay, with a DBH greater than 50 centimeters, we see that there are twice as many large trees in the primary forest than in the degraded. The forest structure can inform us generally about tree size. It doesn't necessarily tell you much about the tree forms that are making up the forest. And so to look at differences in forest composition, we compared the area of each stem form, so figs, lianas, and trees. And the, from this figure, you can see that there is a sim similar total basal area for trees at both sites, so the squares in the top right. You can see there's significantly more lianas and figs in the primary forest, so the lime green triangles and circles. Our statistical modeling revealed that site did in fact have a significant influence on the proportion of lianas and figs at either site. Now looking more specifically at orangutan feeding trees, we compared the abundance of the top 10 orangutan genera that they consume. And so you see that there are some genera that there are similar amounts of. An important difference that we found is this dramatic difference in the abundance of Dipterocarpus and ficus stems. It's important to note that the genus ficus and the many associated fig species it encompasses are an essential food source for orangutans in the primary forest. So if you look more closely, you can see that the abundance of Dipterocarp stems correlates to the abundance of ficus. And this is because large dipterocarp trees are the trees that host the majority of fig species. And so you can attribute the lack of abundance of dipterocarp trees in the degraded forest to its history of logging. And while we would assume that this has a really strong influence on food availability at both sites, food availability may be buffered in the degraded forest by an overabundance of invasive species like Baluchia, like you can see in this bottom right figure, where there's a significant abundance of this invasive fruiting tree compared to it being virtually absent in the primary forest. So just an overview, we found that general diversity did not seem to significantly differ between sites. We saw a dominance of small stems in the degraded forest and of much larger stems in the primary. And then with this greater abundance of large trees in the primary forest, we saw them hosting significantly more lianas and figs. Now, what can this tell us about conservation? So although we see differences in forest structure with the, amount, with the size of trees at both sites, there still appears to be an abundance of small orangutan food trees in the degraded forest, as well as potentially valuable invasive species. Therefore, if protected from future disturbances, secondary forests like this could provide critical population support during periods of low food availability. Orangutans within this landscape are known to utilize a wide range of habitats to buffer periods of fruiting tree scarcity. Their survival hinges on being able to navigate unpredictable local ecology and disruptions to it, whether these be to seasonality or human actions. And our analyses here demonstrate this mixed composition of the degraded forest and the fact that there could be these potentially very valuable invasive species. Overall, this preliminary research elucidates the value and potential support that similar degraded secondary forests across the region could provide in the conservation and long-term survival of the species. And one last thing I want to mention is one of the future directions that I'm working on right now in preparation for my thesis defense and wrapping all that up is being able to add a metric of food availability to what we now know about structure and composition. Um, and lastly, I'd like to thank my advisor, Dr. Cheryl Knott, uh, all members of our lab, and of course, the field assistants, students, and staff at Gunung Palung um, Orangutan Conservation Project. Fantastic work. Questions? I'll throw one out. Okay. Is this a sort of, I'm finding a silver lining here kind of argument? Or um, 
are you really going to suggest something about deforestation or conservation, different practices based on this positive source of food? Well, I wouldn't say that we can cut down the, tree, the, the forests now and that it'll be okay. I think it's more so, I didn't get as much into it here, but part of, I guess, the exploratory research and writing is considering the value of land after it's been disturbed. And so there's not active disturbance, it's not actively being logged or transformed for agricultural use, but what's happening like in the time since. And there's some really interesting other studies showing trends in biodiversity after disturbance and what the difference is if that area is being maintained to some capacity for conservation or just like left on its own. And they see some really interesting patterns in there being greater biodiversity in like actively managed areas that have experienced disturbance. Um, but I definitely would not be like advising, it's like, okay, now it'll all be fine if we cut the trees down. But I think it's interesting to consider how it's much more complex than just, it's been disturbed, this is now an, an inviolable habitat, right? It's definitely more complex than that. Uh, maybe it will be a question following that, um, the, one, the previous one. How do you think your research speaks to our um, intuitive everyday understandings of this um, dynamic of degradation, destruction, regeneration, because it seems to have some counterintuitive um, um, suggestions. How do you interpret its broader significance for everyday understandings of nature versus human activity? Sure, that's an interesting question. I think I almost want to give a similar answer in that it's not so black and white that this is a disturbed, a degraded habitat, and that's the way it stays. Obviously, it's much more flexible and nuanced and dynamic. It doesn't just st stay the way it is, and it depends like what, what actors are involved, human or nature or animals. Um, yeah, I, I would say it just it points to the, the nuance and like the dynamicness of landscape change and like what that means, right? It's not, it's very diffusive. It's not set points, I think, in when things are changing and how the landscape changes and those involved. Um, it's very complex. <laughs> Let's say.